Welcome, welcome indeed. Welcome, welcome, dear ones. What a pleasure it is to feast on the delight of your company. If you are here, you belong. If you are among us, you are one of us. Welcome, stranger. Welcome, beloved. Welcome, friend. Here we celebrate the holy divinity in all beings, in all people, in each and every one of you, sitting here in your beauty, your bounty, your leaping heart or your tired hands, your body that barely dragged it in this morning, or maybe you already went for a run. <laughs> Someone said, oh, no. <laughs> You are welcome in your curiosity or your exhaustion or your gratitude. You are welcome in your whole being and its many parts, the parts that make you proud and the parts that tingle with shame. All of you is welcome here. You're welcome in your fear and your fury, your expectation and your worry, your tenderness or your guardedness, your suspicion or your celebration. You are welcome here, drinkers of coffee, <laughs> and even drinkers of tea, water, drinkers of lemonade, you practitioners of holy conversations in hallways, you holders of truths and stories, you of the shy greetings, and you of the boisterous smiles. We are here now with one another. We are here for one another, to hold each other, to carry one another on, to laugh and delight in each other in times of joy and sorrow, nervous or excited, desperate or joy-filled, doubtful or resolute, weak, need, or standing like an oak in all your variety and complexity and beauty, welcome. Welcome, beloved. Welcome, dear one. Welcome in. Welcome home. Welcome here. Will you please rise in body or spirit for our opening hymn in the Teal Hymnal, number 1021, Lean On Me.
Good morning. Good morning. I'm Reverend Kimberly. I am honored to serve as your Minister of Religious Education. It is so good to be back. The story I have for you today is called The Day You Begin, and it's by Jacqueline Woodson. There will be times when you walk into a room and no one there is quite like you. Maybe it will be your skin, your clothes, the curl of your hair, but there will be times when no one understands the way the world's words curl from your mouth, the beautiful language of a country you left behind. My name is Rigoberto. We just moved here from Venezuela. And because they don't understand, the classroom will fill with laughter until the teacher quiets everyone. Rigoberto from Venezuela, your teacher says so soft and beautifully, your name and homeland sound like flowers blooming the first bright notes of a song. There will be times when the words don't come, your own voice once huge now smaller. When the teacher asks, what did you do last summer? Tell the class your story. We went to France, Chala says. These shells came from a beach in Maine. A boy named Jonathan holds out a jar filled with tiny shells so fragile they look like they turn to dust in your hands, your untraveled hands. My whole family went to India, Spain, South Carolina, a souvenir a small triumph of a journey, their travels going on and on. And as you stand there in front of that room, you can only remember how the heat waved as it lifted off the curb, and your days were spent at home, caring for your little sister, who made you laugh out loud and hugged you so hard at nap time. You can only remember the books that you kept on reading long after she had fallen asleep. And in that room, where no one is quite like you, you'll look down at your own empty hands and wonder, what good is this when other students were flying and sailing and going somewhere? There will be times at lunch when the lunch your mother packed for you is too strange and unfamiliar for others to love the way you do. When even your own friend, Nadja, will wrinkle her nose and say, what is in there anyway? And you'll wonder how she doesn't see the rice beneath the meat and the kimchi. And you'll wonder why she doesn't remember that rice is the most popular food in the world. There will be times when climbing bars are too high, the run is too fast, too far, and the game isn't one you can ever really play. I don't want him on our team. You can watch. Maybe you can have a turn later. There will be times when the world feels like a place that you're standing all the way outside of. And all that stands beside you is your own brave self steady as steel and ready, even though you don't know what you're ready for. There will be times when you walk into a room and there is no one quite like you until the day you begin to share your stories. My name is Angelina and I spent my whole summer with my little sister, you tell the class, your voice stronger than it was a minute ago reading books and telling stories, and even though we were right on our block, it felt like we got to go everywhere. Your name is like my sister's, Rigoberto says. Her name is Angelina, too. And all at once, in the room where no one was quite like you, the world opens itself up a little wonder to make some space for you. This is the day you begin, to find the places inside your laughter and your lunches and your books and your travels and your stories, where every new friend has something a little like you and something else so fabulously not like you at all.
the end. I'm not like them because I stand on this step stool thingy <laughs> that you see me do every Sunday, right? But I still belong. Hello. Hello, everyone. I'm Reverend Dina McFeeders, honored to serve as your associate minister. I'd just like to invite us to wiggle our bodies a little bit and get ourselves settled where we're sitting. Maybe you want to take a deep breath together. Or let it out with a sigh. Ooh, that felt good. Let's try that again. Deep breath. <sighs> Maybe you want to relax your eyes or your face, whatever works for you to feel calm and centered as we enter this time of a spoken meditation, followed by shared silence. And then we'll sing hymn 123, Spirit of Life, while we are sitting and centered. These words are by Tamara Labak, adapted. Spirit of life and love, on this day, we hope to be reminded of the sacred in the ordinary the holy moments of waking yet again to a new day, the feel of the earth beneath our feet, the crisp, cool air on our skin, the joy of being welcomed by our fellow travelers, the warmth of this place, Help us this day to be fully present in our living, awake to each breath. Remind us that life is taking place in the in-between, as well as in our lofty goals. Remind us that the detours and the details craft the path and make it our own. Help us to remember that we did not make this day, but that we have the glorious pleasure to greet every moment as it unfolds, to reach out and kiss its cheek as though hmm, it were a welcome visitor who has come a long way just to see us. These and the prayers of our hearts we now lift up in the silence.
Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I'm, uh, welcome to the First Unitarian Society of Milwaukee. I'm Desiree Pointer Mace, and I'm truly happy to serve as your worship associate this morning. We welcome people of all genders, sexualities, ages, races, ethnicities, histories, and bodies. We welcome your mind, your heart, and your spirit. We welcome all that you're carrying with you today and all that your heart longs to set down. We welcome all the people watching online as we live stream this service. Good morning. We especially welcome guests joining us today. If you are a visiting guest, we invite you to fill out a welcome card located in the pew rack in front of you and drop it in the offering plate that will come around in a few minutes. Please join us for a social hour after the service across the hall in the Lean House Common Room. Some accessibility notes. You can find hearing assist devices and large print hymnals and orders of service at the back of the sanctuary, as well as worship activity bags for children and anyone who wants them. There is a fragrance-free area in the front right views. If you're watching online, you can enable YouTube's closed captioning on your viewing device. <clears throat> you probably noticed we're trying a change in worship by grouping together the congregational life items. The welcome, announcements, affirmation of our mission, and offering, which we are combining with the children's recessional. We're doing this for two liturgical reasons. To increase the art and power of the opening and to give people a quiet place to rest after the completion of the sermon. We are also doing it to gather together the congregational life matters in one sharing section and to give our children the chance to experience the offering. You're welcome to share your thoughts with Reverend Jennifer. Please join. <laughs> All kinds of thoughts are welcome. <laughs> Celebratory thoughts. Please join us as we welcome Reverend Nontombi Naomi Tutu, human rights activist, Episcopal priest, and daughter of Nobel Peace Prize recipient, Reverend Desmond Tutu, as our mortar lecture speaker on Saturday, September 23rd at 3 p.m. Q&A will be followed by our reception. Reverend Tutu will also preach on Sunday, September 24th. Find details on our website. Sign up to have a theme circle experience. Dip your toes in before taking the dive. See the electronic announcements for details and the link to register. I welcome you to share in our first church worship and purpose by inviting you to join me in a unison affirmation of our mission. We gather to nurture the spirit, engage the mind, and inspire action. And with that, I'd like to bring up two new members of our staff this year, Steve Syke, our new ministerial intern, and Caitlin, uh, sorry, Caitlin Barron, the Baroness, please come up, yes. <laughs> Caitlin Barron, who is our new religious education assistant. Steve and Caitlin, will you introduce yourselves to the congregation? Good morning, my name is Steve Seek. I use he, him, his pronouns. And I want to share my gratitude uh, for your welcoming and your guidance in my ministerial formation. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Caitlin Barron, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. And one way that First Church has made me feel really welcome is just getting to know all of the amazing children, families, and volunteers in RE every Sunday. So thank you all for welcoming me. <laughs> Thanks to you both. Folks, let's practice our first church welcome by, on the count of three, we're going to say welcome. Ready? One, two, three. Welcome! <laughs> welcome. Every week, we have an opportunity to practice our values through sharing our resources. Our pledges are at the core of our spiritual practice of generosity. In addition, the church shares half of all the non-pledge cash in the offering plate with a community organization practicing our value of interdependence. 
Today, we share the plate with Milwaukee Area Technical College, MATC, Fast Fund. Fast Fund is our September Share the Plate recipient, and it provides quick financial assistance to MATC students experiencing economic emergencies so that they stay enrolled, graduate, and can achieve long-term success. May the practice of giving bring us joy. The offering will now be gratefully received as we together sing our children's recessional hymn number 407. I invite all children, youth, and RE volunteers to sing the first verse of the hymn and then follow Reverend Kimberly to the Lean House Common Room and then downstairs for religious education. If your child needs to check in for RE, please accompany them to the Common Room now. Will you please rise in body or spirit and join us in singing hymn number 407, we're gonna sit at the welcome table. I went to church with my host sister Ida in the community of Highfield, a high density community on the outskirts of Harare, the capital of Zimbabwe. It was February of 1991. I was a junior in college, and as part of a study away program for the spring semester, I'd been accepted into a Southern African studies program. The Umbofana family had, had welcomed me into their home. They fed me well. They taught me simple songs. They'd given me a Shona name, Sekai, because of my big smile and loud laugh. The next part of that welcome was bringing me with them to church. We got there by walking down a long, unpaved highway with the red earth dust swirling around our ankles. When we arrived, hundreds of members of the congregation were already there, packed into folding chairs in a large metal building with soaring ceilings. It was hot that day. It was hot every day, with the humidity of the rainy season steaming away a little more each day. Ida held my hand as we filed our way into our seats. Now, many of you have met me here and know that music is one of my main joys in life. And the music in church that day was absolutely soul expanding full-voiced, multi-part harmony that are part of the cultural wealth of many Southern African countries and cultures. I easily found a part and could sing along with the opening hymn, even not understanding any of the words as the entire service was in Shona. Mangwanani, greeted the pastor as he processed to the podium. My host family had taught me well, so I replied with the congregation, Mangwanani, good morning. He continued into his opening remarks, and I had a moment to drift away and appreciate the new experience the Umbofana family had extended to me. Where my home church had been small, this was enormous. Where my experiences with church music had been single-line melodies, these were exuberant and polyphonic. 
And of course, when I listened to the minister at home, I had the ability to understand every word, even if my attention wandered, as it was doing right then. <clears throat> Ida elbowed me in the side. I snapped out of my reverie and noticed that the minister was pointing right at me. <laughs> the only non-Shona person among the close to 1,000 congregants. Ida whispered, he wants you to stand up now. <laughs> I gulped. So here we are today, friends. On our day of in-gathering, here and online, the first day of this new church year. For some of us, it might be a joyous return. But for others of us, we might feel or be brand new. So I wonder, what does it mean for us to welcome and to be welcomed? The day Ida elbowed me in the ribs and whispered urgently to stand up, I didn't know what to expect. I looked around. I was definitely the only one receiving this direction. All eyes were on me. But also, all 2,000 eyes were friendly, smiling, including those of the minister. I stood. He looked directly at me and said a few sentences that I couldn't understand. And then, bam, the whole congregation clapped once in unison. It was loud. <laughs> loud enough to mask a small welcome, a whisper. Ida tugging on my elbow again and saying, sit down now. <laughs> which I did. So sometimes welcome is big. It's a thousand people accepting you at once. But I think it's more common for welcome to be small. And by small, I don't mean setting out a welcome mat and calling it a day. Small welcome looks like the intentional planning of First Church to make sure a smiling face was at the door to greet us when we came in. It's creating a musical program, it's planning for religious education. It's making the live stream happen. It's the ongoing gathering in. And in order to do that, we need big and small welcoming acts. After I followed Ida's direction and sat back down, she whispered again, you are now welcomed into this church. You are one of us. And the next hymn, folks, it inflated my whole being. I was buoyed by the literal harmony of inclusion. I sang out loudly. So as we look around at each other now and at our social hour, and just as importantly beyond our first church community, let's not only gather in, but also let's create big and small welcomes. May our voices join together in harmony that rings far beyond our walls.
I'm Reverend Jennifer Nordstrom. I'm so grateful to serve this congregation as your senior minister. I'm grateful to be back after a five month sabbatical and to be with you again. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> On my sabbatical, I had the pleasure of going to a concert here in Milwaukee where I witnessed an entire stadium of people welcome someone. In the middle of the set, the artist was doing crowd work and she noticed a young person near the stage with a sign asking for an autograph. So the artist pulled the sign up to autograph and asked the young person their name. I'm Juno, the young person said. It's new. It's a new name, the artist asked. And the young person said, yes, you're the first person I'm telling it to. I'm the first person to hear your new name, the artist asked over the microphone with 15,000 people listening in. And when the young person shakily nodded, yes, the crowd erupted in screams and cheers and cries of welcome. Welcome, Juno, the artist said, and we shared our screaming, ecstatic welcome in the joy of an impromptu naming celebration. To be honest, folks, I was in tears, and so were many people around me. The roots of the word welcome trace back to the old English will cumin, which means a person whose arrival is pleasing. True welcome connects with this earliest meaning, joy. And while the joy of welcome certainly goes both ways, the roots of the word focus on the fact that giving welcome 
is pleasurable. Giving welcome is joyful. It is expressing our delight at someone's arrival. I felt that joy in that 15,000 person crowd surprised by the delight of getting to welcome a person for the first time. Can you remember a time that you were greeted with that kind of joy where the pleasure of your arrival was felt in the air? Can you remember a time that you welcomed someone with that kind of joy when their arrival at your door caused your heart to leap and your spirit to delight in the joy of being alive together? That kind of joy is special. It makes the heart dance. It makes us remember the pleasure of being alive and being human. And here at church, we get to practice being human. We make a practice of the best parts of being human and alive together in this moment. We practice welcome. Like Desiree said, sometimes it's small and sometimes it's huge, but every day we have the opportunity to practice, to pay attention to the parts of our hearts that leap and swoon at being seen, at being present, at recognizing and witnessing one another in this life. I have a friend who was raised evangelical and was super involved in church life growing up and as a young adult. But my friend also knew that he was queer. And at some point in his 20s, the cognitive dissonance, that tension and opposition between the various parts of himself, his Christian identity, his church reality, the theology of his congregation, and his queer identity, his queer reality and the desire to live authentically as his true self became too much. In a story that's unfortunately all too familiar, things came to a head and he left and also got kicked out in an avalanche of cruelty and trauma. The religious wounding that happens in these kinds of situations is too common. And it echoes for years, sometimes decades, sometimes a lifetime. Part of our work as a religious community is to heal religious wounds within, but also for and with one another. Wounds that are formed in community are also healed in community. It's scary to confront old pain, old wounds, and yet I know that many of you sitting here have. I know because you've told me. People here are healing from all kinds of religious wounds, from sexuality to gender identity to sexism to divorce to racism to the rejection of friends and loved ones to gaslighting. Sometimes religious communities get it wrong. They don't always come together to celebrate one another, don't always center the inherent worth and dignity of every single human being. Since 2014, the University of Pennsylvania's Dr. Jer Clifton has been conducting research on core beliefs and how they shape our perception and experience of the world. According to Clifton, quote, we don't form perceptions based on what's objectively true of the world. Instead, our brains gives us bits and pieces. Our brains are figuring out as quickly as they can how those pieces fit together in a way that makes sense. 
So a general belief about the world as a whole is potentially a critical part of deciding what makes sense from the information our senses are bringing to us. What seems likely? What seems real? Clifton's research into this subject, which was supported and reported by the Templeton Religious Trust, was broad. They had 70 researchers who found 80,000 examples of people expressing a belief about the world mined from over 2 billion tweets. They also held a dozen focus groups with Islamic, Christian, Hindu, and Buddhist people, and they gathered work from psychology and philosophy and art history and comparative religion and anthropology and political science. From all of that data, they developed over 200 questions that they then asked to thousands of people. The research team found four main patterns from all of this data, which I'm now quoting from the summary article in the Templeton Religion Trust. The researchers found 26 core world beliefs they found that those beliefs were stable. They were stable across time, as stable as personality traits like extroversion. They also found that you cannot determine someone's world beliefs by looking at them or knowing their social location, i.e. the beliefs are seemingly unrelated to demographics like gender and race or ethnicity or income. And finally, a, people's core, a person's core beliefs are massively predictive of how they live their life, how they experience the world. Now, there were 26 of these core beliefs, but the researchers found that they could clump them into three main continu continuums. The first one was, do you perceive the world to be safe? or dangerous. The second was, do you perceive the world to be enticing or dull? And the third one was, do you perceive the world to be alive or mechanistic? Now, in Unitarian Universalism, with our history of transcendentalism, our process theology, and our commitment to the celebration of life and the spark of the divine in every living being, we are pretty squarely in the camp of the world is enticing and alive. We celebrate this. In worship, we bring our attention back to beauty again and again as a spiritual practice and we engage with the divine in every living being. That other question though, is the world safe or is it dangerous? It's a little more complicated in our Unitarian Universalist faith and history. We recognize the inherent worth and dignity of every human being with our Unitarian historical clarity that the spark of the divine resides in everyone and our universalist commitment to ultimate redemption for everyone, our awareness that no one person can be reduced to the worst thing they've ever done. And in that sense, we fall on what the Clifton team calls the safe side of the world of perception. We believe in cooperation and stability, that the world is comfortable and doesn't have that many threats because people are ultimately good. However, we also have a deep practice of power analysis. We're committed to being honest witnesses of privilege and oppression, of suffering and redemption. We have a deep commitment to love and compassion and care for all people, which is a moral requirement to work for justice and centering the margins. And that complicates this perception. We're committed to being honest 
about oppression and cruelty. We show up as witnesses to suffering and workers to alleviate, alleviate it and change the conditions that create it. So we don't believe that the world is just comfortable and easy. But we do believe that all people are born with the spark of divinity inside them and that healing is possible and that love is a powerful force in the world made ever more powerful by our collaboration with it. For us, the practice of welcome is about living these beliefs in our congregations and in our lives. Sharing in the delight of welcoming the stranger connects to our core belief that each person is moving through the world with the spark of the divine inside of them. Welcome allows us to partner with love in the project to heal the wounds of the world, especially the religious ones, and open up the possibility of belonging. When my raised evangelical friend decided he wanted to take a risk, after years of staying away from religion, he tried a Unitarian Universalist church. It's scary. It's scary to walk back in the doors of an institution that healed and harmed you after years or maybe decades away. It takes courage to come back and invest in hope, despite the mistakes that humans make. When my friend walked nervously up to the doors of a local Unitarian Universalist church, he was greeted by a smiling person who welcomed him in, handed him a program, and gave him a name tag. These simple gestures Things that a lot of us take for granted felt overwhelming in their love and their acceptance. My friend who presents as queer felt welcomed in with open arms and no reservations. He felt like his whole self was not just allowed at church, but was a delight at church. And let me tell you guys, he felt like that because people said it. Someone said to him, I'm so glad you're here. Someone else talked about the program that day and whether or not he liked it and invited him to come back again. Another person invited him to come on in to coffee hour with them because he was a new person. My friend was in tears many times that day during the music, during certain parts of the liturgy that felt familiar. But the ability to access those tears and the feelings that were under them, feelings like relief and acceptance and the opening to love and spirit and belonging, that was only possible because he felt welcome. My friend now has a new access to faith and to spirituality and to practicing in community, a new access to belonging in religion because one of our Unitarian Universalist churches did their job and welcomed him well. Welcoming people well is a practice. We can't just set out a welcome mat at the door and call it a day. Welcoming someone into church, like welcoming someone into your home, takes intentionality and preparation and commitment. The membership team will tell you all about how much they think about welcome and their work to enact it. If you're excited or interested in that, talk to Lynn Jacoby. I'm sure she'd love to have you on her team. Welcome requires our attention. It is emotional, it is labor, and it saves lives. 
Our Unitarian Universalist faith saves lives. Our UU churches are some of the few places that a trans kid will have an entire community that affirms their identity. That saves lives. Our Unitarian Universalist congregations are some of the few places where an adult who isn't sure about God but needs people, people in a consistent and caring community of shared values, can come and be their whole authentic self, and that saves lives. Our UU churches are some of the few places that young people can come and experience sexuality education that teach about identity and consent and decision making and healthy relationships in the context of our whole lives, and that saves lives. Our mission here is about loving the entire person, loving people authentically and creating space for you to show up and nurture your spirit for your spirit to grow and flourish in your whole self. Doing that kind of work in today's isolated individualist world, it saves lives. The only way that new people have access to this life-saving faith is through welcome. A new person needs to feel safe and wanted and genuinely welcome in their full, complicated, whole self in order to be able to experience the gifts of Unitarian Universalism. And that is why we practice to give people access, people we love, people in our families, ourselves, access to this good stuff this life-saving stuff. We also want our children to have access to it. Today, we had our children and our youth in the service with us for a little bit longer than usual. Our goal with this change is to create lifelong Unitarian Universalists. Unfortunately, Unitarian Universalism has the lowest retention rate of mainstream Protestant denominations. The most recent study found that 12% of our adult Unitarian Universalist congregants were raised as UU. The average mainline Protestant retention rate is 52%. Reverend Kimberly wrote a powerful article in this month's church newsletter where she makes the link between children being in service and our kids continuing to be Unitarian Universalists into adulthood. Without being in worship, without having the texture and the feel of the liturgy, the memories of sitting here in the pews with their adults, children don't develop an ownership of UU worship, an ownership of the sanctuary. And we want our kids to feel like they own this place. Like this is theirs. Like they belong here in all of the parts of it, including worship. And there is joy. There is joy in being able to welcome them here. And also be welcomed by them into their lives, into their faith development. There is joy in the fact that we get to be there in their soft, warm memories of childhood in church. The shapes of us lingering in their memories that they journey with them into the future. Welcome is a practice. It's not a mat we can put out and be done with it. It requires us to return again and again to our values, to the inherent worth and dignity of every human being, 
of all varieties of age and race and class and gender, all varieties of wiggliness and noisiness, all varieties of access needs and body shapes and ways of learning. It's a practice that we return to for the joy of experiencing another's presence at our doors. It's the joy and the pleasure of returning to greet one another's faces, the delight of getting to be human and alive and here together. We'll get it wrong sometimes. We'll forget. We'll be human and we'll get irritated and we'll put our preferences out in the front. And then we'll return again to practicing our values and recall the sheer delight of getting to be here now with one another. I am so grateful to be here with you today. I am experiencing the joy of you welcoming me back to your midst and the joy of being able to welcome people within our midst, the joy of the new baby, the joy of the wiggly toddler, the joy of the neighbor saying amen, amen, the joy of the person we hold the hymnal with. It's a delight to get to revel in one another's variety and humanity and dignity. And the payoff, the payoff is a community where people feel free to be loved as themselves. Feel free to belong in a community that saves hearts and minds and lives, including maybe your own. Amen. Mm -hmm. Joins his voice in my 
Dear ones, what a joy it is to be here together with you in this holy moment, my ship's companions, making meaning, creating care, alive, human. Will you please rise in body or spirit for our closing hymn, number 1064 in the Teal Hymnal, Blue Boat Home. Thank you. 